Hi, I'm Charles Malky, biologist and plant expert with Ivory Organics 3-in-1 Tree Guard Paint, and today we're going to be talking about citrus. I've got next to me um, close to a dozen different citrus varieties. I'm going to try to go into detail. I've spent a lot of time actually preparing notes so I can um, share with you a lot of the history and the background and, um, and where they all came from. And, um, and hopefully to motivate you into hopefully introducing citrus into your garden. Um, and again, no matter where you live in the United States, I know um, California, being here we're in Los Angeles, is a very popular place to grow them outdoors, but you can actually successfully grow citrus both indoors, outdoors, um, as well, pretty much everywhere across the country. The first thing I wanna share with you is we're here at the end of July, and I've got next to me a newly installed Valencia orange tree. Um, all of these trees that I've got here, as they're actually purchased for um, someone that we're actually going to be installing these into their front yard. Um, the goal again is to remove all of the you know ornamental plants and, and grasses and to actually um, be growing things and watering things that'll actually bring food um, to your family and for your neighbors if you have you know excess. So the goal is to actually be you know uh, making sure that your water goes towards things that will actually um, either yield um, fruits and vegetables for your family, as well as to also be planting things that are um, local to your area. We talked about, um, I did a video and I'll put a link down below about um, planting California, since we're here in Southern California, Southern California native plants. And depending on where you live in your regions across the country to actually plant plants that are native to your area to attract the wildlife and the bees and the butterflies that are specific to your area and will be drawn into your garden and help actually um, further pollinate and increase um, fruit yields for you. The first thing I want to discuss here is the fact that we've um, introduced this plant in the summer. We all know that the best time for planting um, trees in your garden or even potting um, plants in your, in your pots is actually in the spring and in the fall. And the reason is, aside from the stress that comes along with actually moving your plants, there's an additional stress being the heat. And right now we're actually going to be approaching a 90 degree day and there's um, we've had days already in the last couple of weeks that hit 100 and above 100 and again We've still got August and September which are our hottest months still coming up ahead And so because of that um, I want to I want to give you guys a tip that will actually help you plant through the summer months without the additional stress of the heat and by doing so um, We've got this product called Ivory Organics. It's a three-in-one tree guard paint. Let me actually bring this to you over here and If you take a look here, it says Ivory Organic and it's a three-in-one tree guard paint. It says it's a natural tree trunk and branch barrier for protection against damaging sunburn and insects and rodents for use on your roses, fruit and nut trees and ornamental trees and shrubs. This product is a non-toxic, environmentally safe and organic product. And I've already had this pre-mix. This is a half a can. I used the other half a can for a neighbor yesterday. Um, but it's basically a powder um, paint that comes and then you just add the water and then also comes with the oils. Um, which help repel the insects as well as the rodents and in this um, situation here By actually applying the paint and I've already sprayed it, but I haven't painted it yet um, But by spraying it if you want to zoom in a little closer, you can actually take a look here on the leaves I did this, you know, I, plant, I installed this plant just a week ago But if you take a look at the leaves here, you can actually see here in the Sun um, all of these white spots and these white spots are the paint but the paint also includes the oils um, which also keep insects off of it so while it's dressed the other thing I want to point out you can see that this is the original stick that came from the nursery and you can see that it was bound very tightly the goal is to make sure that it's an upright tree the first thing you got to do when you bring your plant home is to remove the ties so that the plant water and sugars can um, transport up and down the cambium tissues which is the layer right underneath the bark and we're going to loosen that like so. We can actually remove the stake for now and we're gonna restake it when we're done. The goal being for adding the stake is in case there's a gust of wind, you wanna make sure that it doesn't damage the tree until it actually becomes more sturdy and strong. So we're gonna remove that stake. One other thing I wanna show you as well is the graft line. I wanna show you the difference between the rootstock, which this is a, um, a semi-dwarf tree, so it was grafted on a trifoliate orange and trifoliate meaning three leaves. So you can see that this is the sour orange rootstock and this actually is providing the plant with the drought tolerance and the frost resistance and um, is going to help it actually thrive and do better here in our climate. And then this here is then grafted and you can see this here is the graft union. And then right behind it is a little bit of dead wood. This could have been actually pruned a little bit better and I'm actually going to prune that right now. But this here is a piece of dead wood which would be a good introductory place for um, wood boring insects to actually get into it and into the wood 
which is the center part of the tree. So the first thing I'm gonna do is actually, if you come around so you can actually see this, um, this dead wood over here, we're gonna actually prune it closer to the plant so as the tree expands, it'll actually heal and close in over, over the wound. Um, one other thing we're gonna do, and I haven't done this yet, is actually apply the ivory organic. So I'm gonna show you how we're gonna do that next. I'm actually gonna remove these lower leaves um, to facilitate the application of the paint. So we're just gonna take those off so that the trunk's exposed. And, and then one other point I wanna make to you is take a look at this box over here to my right. And over here is a variety of citrus. And you can notice that when it comes from the grower, they come in these boxes. When they're growing in the nursery, they're actually grown this close to one another as well. So the plants are actually all competing for light, growing as tall and as skinny as possible. But all of these trunks and branches below are all in the shade, if you can take a look at that, except for the ones out of here on the corner. But the ones in the center are all shaded, but as soon as you take this plant, which is here in the center, out, and then plant it into your garden, it's now in the sun. And now it's exposed to full sun, full heat, and maximum exposure, which again, adds to additional stress. So what we're doing here with the Ivory Organics is trying to keep your plants cool through the summer months so that they can continue putting their energy towards growth, uh, fruit development, and, um, and getting better established, stronger roots. So what we're gonna do here is I've got my product here. I've just, again, added the paint powder and the oils. And we're just gonna take a paintbrush and we're just gonna paint that along the bark. And by doing so, we've just created a sunblock for plants or a sunscreen for plants. And this here will now keep the plant cool. I've just um, coated also that spot that I pruned, which had the dead wood. So that's now sealed as well. And I can try to get in between here, but it's a little bit too challenging. And so for these harder branches to get to, um, there's a lot of value in just doing this. I'm just gonna take a spray bottle here, and we're gonna open that up, and just add one or two teaspoons. I did it right before the video so that I can keep on going, but you'll take one or two teaspoons of this product, add it to the container full of water, and we're just gonna stir that, shake it, and spray. And this here is gonna coat not just the leaves, but it's also gonna coat the branches as well. So now I've got a foliar sunblock, and for the leaves as well as the branches. And this is gonna keep the plant cool um, as we still go into August and September, which are our hottest months here in California. So you can see that I've now created a cooler plant. If you wanna zoom in actually one more time so you can see these leaves, you can see how they're coated now in white. This will now dull the leaves and keep the plant cooler, um, especially as we have those um, 90 and 100 degree, 100 degree days coming up. The next thing I wanna share with you is now the varieties of citrus. I wanna encourage you guys to plant citrus and before you just go and pick one from your nursery, I want you to consider you know, the size of the plant and then the variety of the plant. And as I told you at the beginning, these are grafted onto semi-standard rootstocks. If I did a standard rootstock, this plant would grow between 20 to 30 feet tall. As you can see, this is a raised bed type of situation. This is you know, our wall here. If this plant grew 20 or 30 feet, we're talking about a plant that's gonna be two to three feet wide in diameter with a tree trunk that's probably gonna bust and damage this um, retaining wall. So we wanted something with a lot less vigor. And to do so, we went with a semi-dwarf. So it actually grows a little bit slower, it'll be more compact. We're talking about a tree instead of being 20 to 30 feet, something that's gonna be closer to like eight to maybe 15 feet. And again, with pruning, we can control the height. And then if we did a dwarf, a dwarf rootstock would be somewhere between three and five feet. So we're gonna be talking about something that's gonna be more compact and fit in this zone. But my goal was not to, for my vision for this property, was not to have something that's gonna be compact, bushy over here, but something that'll actually be overhead, but again, not a monstrous tree, hence a semi-dwarf. So we did a semi-dwarf Valencia orange. The other thing um, to consider, and I'm actually gonna show you my notes here on the Valencia, is this. So now we're gonna read along a little bit. So the Valencia orange was received as budwood from the buds of the tree um, east of the directors, from the tree of director Dr. Bachelor residence in Riverside, California in 1942. So this tree here is, um, our Valencia orange tree is actually from 1942 and the wood has actually been propagated year after year all the way until today's date by um, cuttings, but more popularly um, by grafting, by grafting them onto either 
dwarf rootstock, semi um, root, dwarf rootstock, or standard rootstock. The season of ripeness, we're expecting to have fruit between March to July. These fruits are seedless, juicy, and not um, not easy to peel, unlike the um, the navel oranges, which we're going to get to next. These are thin-skinned, um, and again, ideally for juicing, and not so much for um, peeling and actually sectioning, which we're going to get to next. So. Our next plant here, and I'm actually gonna pull this up and then try to match it. So you can see here, this is our next tree that I've got here. This one is a, a bear's line. So we'll take a look at now the bear's line description. As you can see here, here's the rootstock. It's um, created as a semi-dwarf. Got a great price for it, $14.98. You can see this here is the rootstock. Again, whoever pruned it, they could have actually pruned it a little bit closer so that we don't have a section of dead wood here. This here is the graft unit, and now this here is the bear's line. We'll actually set this down over here, and I'm gonna pull up my note on the bear's line for you. And here we go. So the bear's line, it originated as a seed, seedling of the tree grown from seed from a fruit of the Tahitian origin in 1895. So it's, this plant is 121 years old. The season of ripeness is between October to December, and it's known by many names such as Tahitian lime, bear's lime, and Persian lime. It's a nearly thornless tree grown vigorously, vigorously to a medium to large size with a spreading form and have white blossoms. It's more cold hardy than the Mexican trees and should do well in areas where lemons are successfully grown. Larger than Mexican limes, approximately two to two and a half inches in diameter. They're seedless, acidic, juicy, and finely textured. The next tree I have here that I wanna share with you is the flame red grapefruit. And again, you can see here is the rootstock. You can actually see the thorns coming out of the rootstock. See that over there? So this here is the rootstock, but notice that the actual flame red grapefruit has very little thorns to no thorns. Right here is the thorn. I don't know if you can capture that in the video. You can see how small that is over here. So you can see that it's a different plant above the graft union, which actually is gonna create the quality and the flavor of the flame red grapefruit. And now let's see its origins and characteristics. Here we go. Flame red grapefruit. The flame red grapefruit is reported to be from a seed of a ruby red grapefruit originating in Houston, Texas, Grove of C. Henderson. Released as a new variety in Winter Haven, Florida in 1987. Season of ripeness is February to June. And it's a vigorous tree with flesh color about the same as a star ruby, more cold hardy than a star ruby. The fruit has a smooth yellow rind and usually has a pink blush, so they're very attractive on your tree. The blush is tender and juicy and has an internal color almost as dark as a star ruby. And the fruit holds well on the tree with some fading of the internal color when held past maturity. If you don't pick them when they're ripe, um, that's one concern is that there could be fading of the inter internal color. Our next plant that I want to share with you here is the Valencia orange. So no point going over this. This is the Valencia orange tree. As you can see, same rootstock. You can notice it's got the same characteristic sharp thorns on here. And then here's the actual graft union. And then this here is the Valencia orange that's on top, but we just um, went over it as that's the tree that I've got planted here behind me that we just treated with the RV Organics. Our next tree that we've got here is the Valencia orange. And again, I was supposed to be planting this for someone, but I think I'm actually gonna be putting this in my garden as well. But here again, the rootstock, the sharp thorns, characteristic of this trifoliate, one of the um, three leaves fell off, but this is a trifoliate orange, the graft union, and then the, um, the navel orange variety. And let me actually show you some notes about the navel orange. Here we go. So this one here is the Washington navel orange. It's of Brazilian origin, imported to the United States in 1870. So this tree that we just held is 146 years old. Um, and again, the wood being mature wood, that's the reason that when you go to graft it within typically a year or two, it'll immediately go into flower and fruit. Whereas if you planted the seed, it could take anywhere from five to 10 years. Again, it's because it's more mature wood that we're working with. It's exceptionally delicious, seedless, and easy peeling fruits. The season of ripeness is November to January. 
not a vigorous um, tree. And that's another reason I want to actually introduce the navel oranges. It's going to give me fruit between November and January, whereas the whereas the Valencia orange, as you can see here, so Washington navel ripens November through January, whereas the Valencia orange, we can expect to fruit between March and July. So it's gonna give us more fresh oranges to enjoy throughout the year. Additionally, because of the lack of, um, so the flowers lack viable pollen, so you can't use the Washington navel orange to pollinate other citrus trees, which um, I'll put a video link down below so you can actually see the importance of actually introducing other citrus. And this applies whether you've got um, cherries or apples or peaches, but um, avocados is another one where actually having more fruit trees, um, not of the same variety, in your garden will actually improve fruit production, but it doesn't apply with the Washington navel because the pollen is non-viable, and that's the reason that the plant's actually fruitless. Um, at its best, in the, it's at its best in the late fall to winter months, but will hold on the tree for several months beyond maturity and stores well sensitive to heat and humidity during bloom and fruit setting, and hence um, restricted in range of climate adaptation. The next plant I'm gonna share with you, and I'm actually just gonna go down this list, um, the Clementine Algerian Mandarin. It was received as budwood from Dr. Fawcett's in 1914. The season of ripeness is October to December. It's a low total heat requirement for fruit maturity. Sensitivity of the seedless fruit to unfavorable conditions during the flowering and fruit setting period. Excessive shedding of young fruits during the fruit setting period can be um, regularized by. So the issue with the Clementine um, Algerian Mandarin is um, is a concern about loss of fruit. And they're saying that to improve fruit production, you gotta um, have cross-pollination with other citrus varieties, such as the dancing mandarin. Some lemons can also cross-pollinate well with the plant and oranges. Um, but obviously we just learned not the navel orange as those um, that pollen is not viable. And it also is very sensitive to fertilizers um, and they encourage fertilizers with higher nitrogen content. content. Irrigation is important and then girdling and light pruning can actually help encourage more fruit production as well. Um, other observation, the fruit size is um, variable ranging from medium sm um, small to medium. The rind is medium in thickness, easy to peel. The color is deep orange to reddish orange, but not as red as the Dancy, um, the Dancy Mandarin. The flesh color, deep orange, juicy flavors, sweet, sub acid, and aromatic and look at the seed content, anywhere from zero to 20. So when the growers actually grow this particular variety, the Clementine Algerian Mandarin, they're usually grown in groves with, um, with thousands of trees and, and very little um, cross-pollinating with other varieties and that helped produce that zero seed content. But when you actually cross-pollinate it now with the lemon and the oranges, as we discussed earlier, that actually results in higher seed content. So um, it results in higher, numbers of fruit on your tree, but it also results in now a seedy fruit. So that's something to be concerned about when actually planting the Clementine Algerian Mandarin. Um, the fruit holds on the tree for several months with little loss in quality, and the tree is, um, has also very strong cold resistance as well. The next I want to share with you is the improved Meyer lemon. And let me see if I can actually find this here. This was actually easy to grab. If you take a look here, this is my improved Meyer lemon. Again, the rootstock, the graft, again. So now um, for the improved Meyer lemon, I wanna actually show this plant. This one's actually really special and I've got four of these in my backyard, actually three in my backyard. The improved Meyer lemon, you can see here, here's the rootstock. This here can actually be brought down um, about another quarter inch um, so that it can actually heal better. And then this here is the wood. And I was quickly able to identify this. As you can see, it's already blooming. Um, this has been grafted about a year ago and you can see that it's already um, wanting to support. Let's go up even a little higher. You can actually see, look at all the fruits and flower up here. Um, the Improved Meyer Lemon is always doing something in your garden. They actually are very adaptable to actually being grown in pots as well. Um, the Improved Meyer Lemon is always doing something. It's either growing, blooming, fruiting. Um, it's a very active citrus tree in the garden, um, beautiful to actually have. Again, if you live anywhere in the United States, I would encourage getting a semi-dwarf to a dwarf variety so you can actually bring it in and out of your house, um, depending on the um, coldness in the season. And let me show you some more details here. 
So the improved Meyer lemon, it's believed to be a hybrid of a lemon and an orange parentage. So it's a cross between lemon and orange. The tree was brought to the United States from Beijing or Peking, China. I've actually found literature that actually goes on, on one of those two cities, but it derived out of China in 1908 by Frank Meyer, a plant explorer of the United States Department of Agriculture. The season of ripeness is year round, but it's mainly in winter. Notes and observation, it's moderately vigorous and cold hardy. It's a shrubby plant, attractive garden tree. The Meyer lemon flowers throughout the year, but mostly in the spring. The flesh is light, orange, yellow, and moderately seedy, juicy, and acidic. And the aroma and the flavor of the Meyer is very distinctive from other lemons and is especially desirable. Um, the original Meyer lemon was introduced, um, had was a carrier of the um, Tristiza virus, but the improved Meyer lemon is actually virus free. So when you actually see Meyer lemon versus the improved Meyer lemon, which is usually what you're gonna find in your nurseries called the improved Meyer lemon, that's a virus free tree. The moderately vigorous and small to medium sized tree. It's very difficult to actually grow the Meyer lemon as a tall tree. So even when it's grafted on a standard rootstock, it usually has a maximum height of about 10 feet. Um, it's a nearly thornless, cold hardy and productive tree, especially adapted um, for use as a potted plant. And the fruit is too tender and juicy to withstand handling, shipping and storage without excessive waste. And that's the reason you will not find it in the in the stores. So the improved Meyer lemon, um, no problem with having a very juicy um, lemon. It's actually somewhat sweet because of the cross with the orange, um, but a very unique lemon, um, a great addition to um, the home gardener. Um, and again, you can have a fruit that you possibly won't find in the stores. So um, the improved Meyer lemon. The next lemon I want to share with you is called the Lisbon lemon. Um, most of us have actually heard about the Eureka lemon. The Eureka lemon is the most popular that you'll find in your store. But the Lisbon lemon is of Portuguese origin and arrived to California as early as 1853, so 163 years old. The seed content um, is variable, but usually few to none. Um, the color is yellow at maturity, the rind medium thick, it's juicy, flavor, and very acidic. And actually when people actually compare the Lisbon to the Eureka lemon, when it comes to flavor, the Lisbon lemon usually wins. It's a um, the crop comes mainly in the winter and early spring. The tree is vigorous, upright, spreading, large, thorny, um, which is a negative um, that it's actually got thorns. It's densely foliated and productive. The tree is most vigorously and bright, um, most vigorous of the varieties grown in California and most resistant to adverse conditions such as frost and heat and wind and neglect, which again now makes the Lisbon lemon more desirable than Eureka. The Lisbon fruit is generally smoother and less ribbed than the Eureka, and the tree is quite different from the Eureka, however, and easily distinguishable. So again, the Lisbon lemon of Portuguese origin. And now for the Eureka lemon. And let me actually show you my Eureka lemon before I read this to you. If you take a look over here, So this here is my Eureka lemon. We just installed it about six months ago. Um, this plant was about half the height and I've also done a couple of videos which I'll actually put the video link so you can see what it was like just about three to five months ago. And it's growing vigorously. This is all the new growth that it's put out in the last about 60 days. If you come in a little bit closer, I know it's got some fruit in here. If you take a look here, you can see there's, um, here's a lemon over here and I know there's about 10 fruit in here if I took my time. Not gonna happen. And so this here's Eureka lemon. You can see it's extremely vigorous. It immediately wants to go into fruiting. Um, again, we're still in the middle of summer. It's gonna bloom best in the spring and it's gonna hold the most fruit um, going into next year. But you can see we're actually gonna end up with a very large, um, this is a standard size um, Eureka lemon. It's one of the most vigorous of the citrus varieties. And we'll have a tree since it's on standard rootstock that'll be somewhere between 20, um, anywhere I'd say 15 if I want to control the height, but it can grow as tall as 25 feet. So this is gonna be a large tree that's gonna be offering some shade to our car that we usually park here on the side and hopefully um, benefit from a lot of lemons. Come around. So the Eureka lemon tree, surprisingly, we're here in Los Angeles and it originated in Los Angeles, California. It started as a group of seedlings grown from the fruit of Italian origin, the seeds of which is said to have been planted in as late as 1858. So the tree we were just with 
um, originated from 158 years ago. That wood has been propagated year after year after year for 158 years until we've got it now here in our garden. The crop is well distributed throughout the year, but mainly in late winter, spring, and early summer. The most popular store lemon is a Eureka lemon. But I'm writing here, but seriously consider the Lisbon lemon because it's more frost and heat tolerant, and I've got one in my backyard. The seed content is few to none. It's a vigorous growing, spreading, and open and growing habit, virtually thornless. It's strongly everbearing and produces fruit at the ends of long branches. It's more sensitive to cold, insect infestation and neglect um and neglect where are we and it's shorter lived so again these are negatives against the eureka lemon um and another reason to actually go with the lisbon lemon because of its um because of its precocity thornlessness and ever bearing nature it soon arrived um it soon rivaled the lisbon variety but have remained the principal varieties in California and have achieved the status of major lemon varieties of the world. So the Eureka lemon is, like again, the plant you're probably most likely gonna find in the nurseries and it's probably the lemons you're actually gonna be buying in your store. But the Lisbon is a rival. Again, it's got um, a lot more defenses. It's actually longer lived and it's actually a lot easier um, plant care than the Eureka lemon. Um, and again, when it comes to flavor, the Lisbon usually wins. Nagami kumquat, and I'll actually show you my tree behind me, which I've got growing in a pot. It was received as budwood from Mr. Hale's ranch in Santa Barbara in 1912. The parentage and origins are unknown, even though I thought I was able to find it and maybe someone, one of my viewers can actually do the research for me. Uh, but the season of ripeness is year round, but it flowers between July and August. And here we are at the end of July and I've already got some fruit holding um, and no flowers um, from the flowers when it bloomed about a month ago. The, it's an acid fruit, popular in Asian countries, especially China. Popular gifts for Chinese New Year's. The tree is small to medium in size with a dense and somewhat fine texture. They're cold hardy um, to their tendency to becoming semi-dormant from late fall to early spring. The entire fruit is eaten. The orange rind is actually sweeter than the inside fruit. And the fruit on the inside is light orange flesh, is acidic. And the fruit contains about five to six seeds typically. But again, when you eat the fruit, you eat the entire thing and the skin is actually um, where the sweetness and the best flavor is at. Let me actually show you my, my Nagama kumquat. So here we are with the Nagami kumquat. We did a video on this and how to plant it and some planting tips for actually putting citrus in, in, your, potted, um, in your potted soil. As you can see here, this here is actually coated with the green Ivy Organics paint. So we actually did sunblock protection. You can see if you zoom in, um, some of the cracks that are happening now in the paint. This is not a, you know, a, a durable paint that's meant to last 10 or 20 years. This is an organic paint that actually breaks down over time that allows the plant to grow and expand. Take a look if you actually zoom in over here. You can actually see the cracks in the wood as the plant is expanding and growing. These here are actually um, attempts to actually create branches, but we want this to be in tree form. And we can allow this sun to actually hit the tree because it's actually protected. This will not burn the plant because it is protected with the Ivory Organics 3-in-1 um, Tree Guard paint color green. If we zoom in up here a little higher, let's take a break. So here we are again with the Nagami Kumquat. We've actually um, selected the standard size variety. Um, so again, it was grafted now on a standard rootstock. The, um, the rootstock is this section over here. And then it was grafted. And then this here is the Nagami Kumquat from this point up. And then this will actually control the height. A standard um, Nagama kumquat can grow anywhere from, again, about 12 to 15, maybe 20 feet. Again, being in a pot, it'll actually grow a lot less than it would otherwise grow in the soil. And um, one other thing I wanna share with you now, so this just went into bloom and I can actually see there's possibly some more flowers coming soon as we said it blooms typically in, um, in July and here we are in July. But take a look at the fruit from when it actually bloomed. Here's one fruit over here. And we'll take a look in here. Take a look at that. And take a look at that. And if you notice the leaves, when we actually planted this, we actually covered it with the Ivory Organics white to actually um, keep the plant cool as we're um, bringing this actually at a hot time into the garden. But take a look at all those white leaves and then the plant continue to grow. And these are all the new leaves. These are not coated um, and it's no longer under the 
I want you to tell them that that you painted with green ivy organics. I thought so I already did. That, no, I you did didn't at the mention. Beginning. No, you didn't mention ivy organics. Okay, keep you going. You didn't mention at all. Let me just keep going. I'm I trying can to cut. tell you. So they know that there's an option for right. green. So as you can see, we've actually um, you know sprayed this with the ivory organics um, white as we did with the spray bottle. I'm not going to spray this again because um, the plant is no longer under the stress of the heat. If we had a 100 and 105 degree day and I don't see the plants burning, I'm not going to be applying this product. But again, we, it's the same thing that we use for a newly installed tree. It's we've got about one to two teaspoons per, um, per spray bottle and we just spray on the outer part, that'll actually lighten the leaves and keep the plant cool as it gets acclimated to your new growing zone. Um, so again, you've seen the fruit. Let me actually show you some flowers and then I'm gonna show you the tree trunk as well again. Um, so if you zoom in on this end, you can actually see that it's actually got some flowers that are gonna be blooming again. So it looks like it's gonna to wanna to put out another round of flowers and hopefully some more fruit. Um, and if you take a look down again, you can see that rather than using white on this tree, we've selected to use green. So this is green ivory organics that was painted on and encoding the tree all the way down to the base. And this here is protecting it from any sun as again, this whole lower part of the tree is exposed to a lot of light and citrus are known and very susceptible to sunburn as well. Let's continue with the rest of the trees. I just had to pull this tree out as well. Take a look at this. So here we are. This here is um, the flame red grapefruit. So we just discussed this tree. Um, again, the trifoliate rootstock that it was grafted on. This here is the graft union and then the plant grows up. And then the reason I brought this here is take a look at... <laughs> Here's another surprise. Take a look at this insect over here. You see that praying mantis? Do you capture that? Let's see if we can see it one more time, and then we'll let it go. Let's try to see that praying mantis in there. You get another important reason for growing things organically. I know you're trying to control pests when you see pests on your plants, but be very careful adding even you know, neem oil and spinosad in your garden as it does harm your beneficial insects as well in your garden. Um, I meant to grab this tree, which here is um, our Oro Blanco grapefruit. So we didn't discuss this one, I thought I actually grabbed the Oro Blanco again, the rootstock, the um, graft union is right here, and then grows up. And then take a look at the end of this. Take a look at all those fruits. So we've got this plant, it's grafted about a year ago, and it's already wanting to give one, two, three, four, five, six fruit. So um, again, on a, on a semi-dwarf rootstock. Let's take a look at the Oro Blanco and take a look at its history. So if we take a look here, Oro Blanco grapefruit. You can't fly, right? Nope, they walk. You walk, you said? They walk. Oh. <clears throat> So the Oro Blanco grapefruit, the patent is held by the University of California Riverside and it was created in 1958 and released in 1984 grows to um, reproduce. It's a hybrid acidless pomelo crossed with a seedy white grapefruit. So it's got the characteristics of pomelo, which is a giant citrus with the white grapefruit. The seasons of ripeness are December through March and the growth is vigorous to a large sized tree with a somewhat spreading form. The fruit has a smooth greenish yellow and rind at maturity. The flesh is very pale yellow and seedless and the flavor is mild and sweet. The Oro Blanco is early um, in its maturity and holds very well on the tree. One other thing I want to tell you about the Oro Blanco grapefruit is that of all of the grapefruit varieties, and I've done research on the Ruby Reds and the Flame and the Oro Blanco and the Cocktails and a whole bunch of um, grapefruit varieties, but if there's one grapefruit variety you can pick for your garden, I would have to pick this. And I've actually got one in my garden as well. So the Oro Blanco grapefruit is super sweet, even though it doesn't have the pink and the red, which is you know attractive to have um, for a fruit. The Oro Blanco is actually the sweetest and will actually be one of the most enjoyable seedless grapefruit varieties you can have in your garden. So the Oro Blanco grapefruit. And when it comes to lemons, we discussed lemons. 
Um, we love lemons in our garden. We probably have about 10 lemon trees. Um, my favorite of all of them is the Lisbon lemon and the Meyer lemon. And the lemons are important to our family, not just for making lemonade, but it's you know, we're having salad a few times a week. It's used in our salad dressings. It's used in marinating um, our foods. It's used in um, in teas. It's used um, in a variety of ways. There's not a day that usually goes by where we're not using at least one lemon. So um, of all the citrus that we've so far discussed, I'd say if you're gonna plant one, make sure that it's a lemon, um, especially if there's a chef in the family. Let's see what else we have here. We've done them all. Yeah. <coughs> so, in conclusion, and I just want to share one more thing. This here is a citrus I actually got from one of my neighbors. Um, as you can see, um, maybe you can try to identify it, but I know it would help if I cut it, but I don't have a knife on me right now. Um, but this here, she says there's a variety of lemon, but she's grown it from seed. So, and she's got a backyard full of other citrus um, between oranges and lemons and grapefruits. So this could be a cross of something new. Um, if you actually plant citrus in your garden and you're growing things from seed, you always risk the fact you might be creating some type of mystery fruit, um, whether it's beneficial or not. Um, but you're gonna be wasting five to 10 years every time to find out what it is compared to actually buying something that actually comes on a grafted rootstock and by actually grafting the variety you know you're always going to get this amazing superior fruit um, with store quality um, and actually you know better than store quality because you're actually going to be picking in your garden and knowing that you've grown the plant organically um, and using the best um, materials anyways i hope you found this video informative and if so be sure to like it i'm also going to be adding the link which shares all of this educational content um, i used um, some information I believe from the University of Riverside um, website. So I'm going to be including that link down below so you can actually continue reading a lot more on citrus. Um, again, I hope you found this video helpful um, and be sure to subscribe down below so you can stay tuned to all of our other Ivory Organics educational gardening videos. Thanks again for watching and happy gardening.